So as far as delivery systems, this is another uh, difference between a compounding um, formula and a traditional conventional formula. Um, again, there are creams. So we can use the biest, is the biest meaning two estrogens, the estradiol and estriol is probably the most common form of estrogen used. I personally like to prescribe cream for women because it's uh, well absorbed when it's applied properly in the thinnest skinned areas of the body like wrist, uh, wrists behind the knees and, and tops of feet. feet. <laughs> and then um, there are lozenges or trochees is the other name for that where these are uh, basically placed in the mouth next to the mucosal membrane which is the inner cheek for absorption into the bloodstream and then there are other um, ways of delivering hormones like uh, injections particularly for testosterone uh, and then pellets these are subdermal pellets that can be they're basically it's an incision in the hip and these um, Hormones are placed there for release over, you know, three to four months time, time span. I, yeah, I see mixed results with patients. So again, I, I typically uh, advise for creams, but would do lots and just for patients who come to me and who have done creams without any benefits. Um, and then we try the lozenge. They're just better at absorbing that way. And, and so they, they see um, benefit with that. Um, as far as safety and hormones, um, always a safety issues to consider here would be a family history of breast cancer. Of course, if there's an estrogen receptor or a progesterone receptor positive breast cancer in mom, the, I, would, I would suggest probably not doing hormone therapy. It may not be in your best interest. You know, we know genetics doesn't dictate everything, but there are many other ways to have relief in, in menopause without doing a hormone therapy. Um, if there's a personal history of breast cancer, you know, again, I, I wouldn't advise uh, doing it either. Um, oral estrogens, I, I have an issue with oral estrogen, particularly meaning a capsule. We swallow estradiol. Again, that refers back more to the conventional way of receiving hormone therapy. Estradiol, when we swallow it, when we swallow estrogen, it really provokes some of the inflammatory uh, markers. So uh, you may or may not be aware that there is a, a blood test that it's one that I commonly run called CRP, C-reactive protein. And when we have this elevated in the blood, this actually increases inflammation in the blood vessels, which puts us at risk for heart attack and stroke. And so oral estrogen, so estrogen pill, it is one of the things that can increase CRP. So again, when there are many different routes to receive estrogen or some of these other hormones I'll talk about next, you know, I, I would suggest perhaps, you know, talking to someone and if you're on oral estrogen, consider switching to, to something different. Um, and also another negative with oral estrogen is that it can uh, trigger clotting factors and because of um, it goes through the liver more than the uh, cream or the other route. So again, I'm not a big fan of the oral estrogen. Um, progesterone, I haven't really spoken about that yet, so I will take a moment to do that now. Um, progesterone can be a fantastic hormone to use, and sometimes when women are going through menopause, you know, we can handle all, the, all their symptoms with herbs. You know, some women who just cannot get a good quality of life, their hot flashes are really not reducing, we, we need to step it up and, and, and try this next tier, meaning the hormone therapy. And so um, some women do great with just using progesterone, if, if, especially if the issue is insomnia. Progesterone we typically produce when we are cycling regularly, um, meaning prior to menopause. Um, it usually is pro uh, promoted about two weeks out of the month. Um, but when we aren't ovulating, meaning we're not having regular cycles, our production of progesterone really declines. And so we lose the benefits that it, it once provided. And so progesterone actually, when it's broken down by the body, it, it turns into a, a metabolite that binds to receptors in the brain called GABA. And GABA is a brain chemical that helps with anxiety when it's promoted properly, and it can help with good quality sleep. And so when we have low levels of progesterone, which again naturally happens with menopause, 
we may be having some of these issues that could be remedied with the use of progesterone. And progesterone too can be made up in a cream. It can be also used um, uh, conventionally, meaning you can get it at Walgreens or CVS and it is bioidentical. So you could also use it from a traditional pharmacy um, as well, and particularly an oral, a pill form of progesterone can be even more sedating. So again, if we're having issues with insomnia, um, this could be a, of great value um, in adding that in. Um, reasons as to why it may not be uh, suggested to you um, if you're already on hormone therapy uh, is that if you've had a hysterectomy, you have no uterus, then uh, it's common knowledge amongst all physicians that progesterone's one of its benefits when using estrogen is that it decreases risk of cancer of the uterus. And so it's always combined when someone has a uterus. But if you've had a hysterectomy and you don't have one, it's often not offered to the patient. They may just be on estrogen solely. And so we may be lacking benefit if we're not on progesterone in combination of all the things that I mentioned. So we definitely would want to, to be on it, especially if we're on estrogens. Um, and just a brief mention about testosterone. This too um, can be used uh, as a hormone um, treatment for someone who has low libido, potentially fatigue, and particularly if levels are actually low in the blood, that may be something that would be um, discussed. Um, and again, there are different forms. Sometimes we just add everything in a cream and we get it all in that way. And sometimes we don't need to use everything and we again, everyone's unique. So and that's, um, and that's some of the information I wanted to share on the hormone therapy. Let's talk about three health issues that um, masquerade as hormonal imbalances. And there are even more than three, but um, for the sake of time, we'll talk about um, the three important ones. Um, because ultimately, you know, in practice, I have patients who do fantastic, again, with herbs. We don't need to be further. They don't have a lot of other health issues. I have patients who, despite being on every hormone they could imagine in the highest doses, they still don't feel right. And so to me, we really are missing something if that's the case. And so it's important to investigate further. And in a lot of my patients, we, we kind of look at these things based on symptoms anyways, um, but I want to make sure that um, you're advocating for yourself um, in these other areas too, if you're not where you need to be. So. Adrenal and thyroid health issues. Um, there can be many symptoms that can present themselves when we have dysfunction here. Um, a common theme um, is stress, especially when it comes to these two glands. Um, adrenals particularly uh, sit on top, they're little glands, they sit on top of the kidneys and they produce a multitude of hormones. Um, particularly for this talk, we'll talk about adrenaline, hence the name. So that's the norepinephrine, the epinephrine when we're under stress and we have anxiety. That's what's pumping through our, our, you know, our veins. Um, cortisol which has to do with if we're producing too much, you know, the factors of weight. Um, Fatigue can happen when it's too high or too low. And then we have DHEA, which is another really important hormone when it comes to hormone um, benefit because it helps make estrogen and testosterone. So if, if we're under a lot of stress and life can be overwhelming at times, but we don't have coping mechanisms in place, um, our adrenals really start to feel it. And as I mentioned initially, we can really start to feel some of that adrenaline, the anxiety, the discomfort with that. And over time, that starts to really wear on the function of this gland. And I, I kind of liken the, the adrenals to a, you know, a wet cloth. When you wring it out, you wring it out, and you wring it out, there's just really not as much that the body can, this can, gland can give to the body anymore. And so of course, you know, dealing with stress, we'll talk about that but the ramifications of that then start to affect cortisol. And cortisol um, should be highest in the morning, so we get out of bed and we have good energy. And as the day progresses, it slowly declines. So at nighttime, it's low, we fall asleep, and we stay asleep, hopefully. Um, and that's the, the perfect rhythm, it's called circadian rhythm of adrenal function. But again, if, if we're under stress and just the longevity of be being on planet Earth, you know, unfortunately does wear, wear this gland down. And so the cortisol is no longer able to produce um, 
uh, what it what it needs to to help with energy, to help with proper sleep. Um, and also cortisol is a natural anti-inflammatory. So some individuals can have more ickiness because the cortisol can't put out little fires here and there. And so again, this can be a major factor for one's health if, if we're not looking into this. And then as I mentioned, DHEA is um, ex extremely important because it, it makes estrogen and testosterone. In fact, 60% of hormone production after the ovaries decline in their output is revolves around adrenal glands ability to make DHEA because again that makes more estrogen and that makes more testosterone for the body to utilize and so I always like to check this even in my my younger women who aren't even close <laughs> to menopause I think this is an important tool for different reasons but especially to help ease a transition into menopause or if we're in the middle of it and we're still suffering we, we really need to to evaluate for for this um, and of course you know poor sleep you know that if we're not sleeping properly a bad sleep hygiene you know then again this is going to pull us into a, a vicious cycle um, as far as testing for adrenal specifically you see on the bottom here I I like saliva cortisol testing it's my favorite way to really analyze what's going on because we are seeing what's happening uh, on a complete day. So typically we collect a saliva sample in the morning, midday, late afternoon, at, before bed, again, because I'm wanting to see a high and then slowly decline to a low. And if, if that's not happening, then I know that we need to go in and you know address um, some very specific things um, because we're not feeling good if, if that's what the, the test result shows. You know, some instances we have to do cortisol AM in a blood test just because insurance won't cover it. Um, and, and so that gives me some information and I see value in that. But again, saliva cortisol testing is of most benefit. Um, also, DHEA S, particularly in the blood, can be done to get, give us that information to see if that's being produced properly, in essence, and helping the estrogen and, and testosterone um, to be more adequately produced. All right, so let's talk about thyroid um, imbalance. And of course, adrenal, again, adrenal and thyroid can go hand in hand. So if adrenal has an issue, then thyroid and vice versa. Um, common thyroid symptoms would be irregular cycles, fatigue, um, inability to lose weight, um, constipation. And this is particularly hypothyroid, low functioning thyroid. Um, and, and hot flashes, cold intolerance, these are, are temperature regulation issues can be wrapped around hypothyroidism. And then there, there is more of a rare occurrence of hyperthyroidism, but this too can cause heart racing, which can happen in menopause. And can it cause hot flashes, you know, as well. And so testing, you know, would allow us to identify really if, if there are issues here with the imbalance. Um, I annually, at the very least, everyone should minimally have done a TSH, which is a brain signal to the thyroid gland, a free T4 and a free T3. Um, there are other tests that can be done to give us more information like reverse T3, although insurance sometimes doesn't cover that. Um, and also anti-TPO and anti-thyroglobulin antibodies. So uh, what those two are, those help us diagnose Hashimoto's, which is where the immune system um, turns on itself. It's called an autoimmune disease, where the immune system starts attacking its own thyroid. And so over time, that causes a decline of, of thyroid function and, and can be why someone becomes hypothyroid. Now, if we do all that testing and particularly the, the antibodies, the Hashimoto's antibodies are elevated, I don't typically stop there. We, we need to find out why, why is the immune system attacking the thyroid? Um, and so again, we're invest, investigating other, other issues like food allergies and gut function and, and environmental to hopefully find, if we can, why this is um, all beginning. So um, as far as, you know, if these are issues, uh, we want to treat treat them specifically using um, herbs if possible. So particularly for the adrenals, 
Um, I like using herbal combinations, you know, that often have ashwagandha in there and, you know, Siberian ginseng, um, holy basil and rhodiola. Um, those are great formulations if they contain those. Vitamin C is an extremely important nutrient for the adrenal gland. And if we have low DHEA, then we definitely want to replace that DHEA while the body, uh, while we heal the adrenal glands with these other things. And so um, DHEA can be prescribed, you know, anywhere from five to 50 milligrams. And I, I generally like to see it on the lower end of like five, 10 milligrams to decrease any negative side effects that can occur with too much, like acne, hair loss, which can already be issues with someone who's going through menopause. Um, and then sometimes when the adrenals are, are really depleted or if someone is physically depleted, uh, IV therapy can be a great benefit, particularly high doses of vitamin C, just because we can't tolerate, our intestinal tract really can't tolerate too, too much vitamin C without having you know, loose stool. So having it given you know, intravenously can really help kind of speed the process up a little bit. And then, of course, stress management, you know, therapists, talking with friends, exercise, trying to, to promote a good sleep routine, you know, no computers before bed, dark rooms um, would be something that you could do to be really proactive in all of this. Um, the next category, number two of um, mas the masquerade of other health issues has to do with uh, the digestive tract. And um, common digestive issues that can happen in, in any time um, in life, but I can, we can see this more with um, menopausal women, would be bloating, um, nauseousness, irritable bowel, um, someone who has constipation or deals with diarrhea, multiple bowel movements a day after meals, more loose, um, heartburn would be another example. Um, and there are different underlying causes to why these issues may, may be present. And I wanna to state too that um, you may not have any digestive issues um, at all and you could still have parasites or candida. It just may manifest in a different way. So fatigue can be present because of these uh, weight gain. I, I wanna to say too that uh, I'd say an equal issue for menopausal women is not only hot flashes, but it's weight, weight loss. It, it's a struggle for most uh, women, and it's unfortunate because it is it's truly, it's truly an issue. Metabolism definitely slows, and I will say, going on any amount of hormone therapy does not alter it. We really have to think outside of the box to try to get the metabolism to to click a little bit more to kind of aid in um, in the weight loss um, aspect. And so this is sometimes where we we look. Um, and also, you know, digestive issues can be connected to mood issues, depression and or anxiety and inflammation. So many people who have arthritis may have another underlying issue here. And once we address it, um, we obviously see a trend of improvement in how someone's feeling. So I'm just going to briefly talk about these different aspects here, uh, starting with candida. Um, Candida albicans particularly is in everyone's intestinal tract along with bad bacteria and hopefully good bacteria. And um, Candida specifically can be increased when someone's on oral birth control, when we use a lot of antibiotics to kill off the good bacteria. Uh, those are steroids, those are, and more importantly, carbohydrates, sugars of, of really any kind can stimulate these um, candida albicans and make them grow in number. And the more that there are present, the more problems can occur. And this isn't just particularly to digestion. It, the candida are broken down by the body and they turn into alcohol into the bloodstream. So we can have fatigue associated with this. Again, stubborn weight loss, um, arthritis, mood issues can all be connected potentially um, to this imbalance in the gut flora and this you know, elevation of candida. Um, SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what this is, is really a couple of different reasons this can happen. Ultimately, this is bacteria present in the small intestine. And ultimately, bacteria don't belong in the small intestine. It's, it should be a sterile place where nutrients are absorbed. 
um, to be utilized by the body. And instead, these bacteria either migrate from the large intestine into the small intestine or the low acidity in the stomach does not break down the bacteria that travel through the once we're eating it and it gets to the small intestine and kind of finds a new home there. Um, the issue with that is, is again this bacteria they don't belong and they start eating foods that you're eating and they start releasing gases and these gases can affect us digestively so this can cause this 70 percent of IBS is related to SIBO um, and it can cause bloating. Some, some individuals speak that they have more pressure in the top stomach area of their body, belching like they've never belched before and they're belching now. Um, these are some of the digestive issues that can accompany uh, SIBO, but also a fatigue. Um, they've connected SIBO to fibromyalgia where we're having more pain and tenderness in the body and again, tiredness. It can cause, I see this often, it can cause weight gain um, and hair loss because if we're not absorbing nutrients, then we're not getting the nutrients to the cells for proper use. And so again, this is something that's extremely important um, to identify if, if this is an issue. And then uh, parasites. So we would think, oh, how uncommon for me. I've never traveled outside of the United States. I, it's unlikely that this you know, could be an issue, but it is possible. So dogs carry, carry worms and, and parasites, sushi. And again, if you are someone who travels outside of the country, you could be um, exposed to parasites. And so uh, fatigue, stubborn weight. I do see warmth, hot flashes, night sweats that can accompany um, uh, parasites uh, as well. And so these are things we definitely want to consider. Oftentimes talking to patients and get an idea that this may be occurring. Um, so uh, then that would kind of lead to further investigation if that was a concern for, for both of us. So, you know, ways to really evaluate if someone has um, candida or parasites, you could do a stool test to identify and, and see if that's there. Um, a SIBO test is a breath test, actually. You're given a solution to drink and you have to breathe into different tubes um, over a two hour time frame because ultimately, if the, the bad bacteria are there, they are giving off a gas, methane and hydrogen. And um, we, we collect these gases in your breath and again, the, the laboratory will then analyze to see if they're present so if they're present then we know you have it and of course you know then we want we want to treat so ultimately we want to treat the underlying issues and this may be you know again masquerading as menopausal symptoms but um, really may not be connected to the hormonal balance whatsoever and then the third thing I wanted to mention is food sensitivities um, usually when there is know a, a dysbiosis or an imbalance in the digestive tract that can then create inflammation in the intestinal lining and there therefore cause um, a propensity to have food sensitivities and of course if we are eating something that our body doesn't like then we are going to feel even worse and so we again may not only just have further worsening of digestive symptoms but we could have a, a weight loss that's not budging uh, achy joints, even allergies, could just be some other examples of eating the wrong foods for the body. Um, and so in practice, I commonly see issues with wheat, uh, dairy, bakers and brewers, yeast. Uh, those three are the most common. I do see patients, um, when we do testing, I'll, I'll say, who show up with having eggs and nuts, like almonds or cashews, and that's you know, again, an, another particular issue with many who are, are struggling with the weight loss department is, well, why I'm eating healthy? Why am I not losing weight? Well, it could be that they're eating something that may be in theory healthy, just not healthy for their body. And so, you know, doing a food sensitivity test would probably be the best way to go, just because it does give us so much, you know, information as far as the, the individualization of the reaction of these foods to that person. And so of course, if we identify the foods that are bothersome and we avoid those foods, we often see improvements in how that person's feeling. We typically do so you know, for eight weeks. Um, and this particular food sensitivity test that I use in practice 
um, does look for 90 different food reactions, and including candida, so we do know if yeast is a culprit here. Um, Another way to address a potential for food sensitivities is, is looking to see if we um, are eliminating uh, just the most common you know, food sensitivities. And so again, wheat, dairy, yeast are the major ones that I, and sugar, of course, because um, that creates inflammation and it can stimulate yeast, uh, candida yeast in the gut. And so if we don't do the food sensitivity testing, then it's really a good idea to, to avoid the, again, the common food allergies. And I do think treating, you know, for the, the candida at the same time could, could bring us a, a great benefit. Um, and, and also, of course, looking at probiotics and other gut healing herbs that may be necessary to add in too, based on the, extens um, the extensity of the food test results. So if someone has many different food sensitivities, we know their gut's inflamed. Therefore, we're gonna to want to work even harder at getting them you know, in balance. And I don't think I mentioned this, that typically anything, um, about two months is the best time frame to avoid these food sensitivities because it does take time for the body to kind of detox them out, of, uh, to find an established balance. And then oftentimes we, we can add some of these foods back and, and either recognize that it's not, no longer an issue or realize that it is, and, and then it ultimately becomes a choice, whether it's something that you want to eat just because you have to have it and you can pay the price, or you know, you decide I just not worth, you know, it's just not worth it and, and you continue to avoid it. Action plan to feel amazing in menopause. So let's kind of re recap here. Eat yes foods every day. Avoid the no foods as much as possible. Consider your stress triggers and start a new habit to reduce stress. Practice good sleep hygiene. Try one of the top herbal remedies for menopause. Talk with a doctor about natural hormone replacement therapy if you think that that's right for you. And get evaluated for hidden health issues. So I know that if you implement even one of the ideas that we talked about today, you'll be on your way to feeling more amazing in menopause. When I work with patients one-on-one, -on -one, we're able to get much more specific and to identify your health issues. At the beginning of this talk, I promised I would share how you can explore naturopathic medicine further. The best way to do that is to schedule an initial consulta consultation with me. Um, I work with women like you in my office every day. When you come in for a visit with me, we explore your health history and choose lab tests that are most relevant to better understand your physiology. I make individualized recommendations for nutrition, dietary supplements, and hormone replacement if needed. Thank you for being here with me today. My passion really is helping women like you transition gracefully through the phases of life.